He had pitched this idea of an animated animal world where animals had actually built the world that they're living in, this animal city idea. Disney hasn't done, you know, one of these types of movies in a long time, and it was really exciting. And John said, I will fully support any film that features animals running around in little clothing. He said, if you guys are going to do an animated animal film, you really have to go and become experts on all of these subjects. You have to find out about how animals behave. You have to find out how to build cities. How would animals live in that city? How would they design it? What kind of animals would even live there? You have to figure out what's going to be unique about this world. And so he said, don't think about story right now. Just go off and do research. We started our research by going to Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park. And we learned so many amazing things from the incredible animal experts that were there. A lot of it was this interesting trivia that we said, well, we'll put it to the side and we'll see if it finds its way into the film. You can't trust any animal that can see in two places at once. Get them. Animators have to think about what makes that animal feel and look like an animal. We had our head of animation here, Renato Dos Anjos, and we had our head of look development, Michelle Robinson, and we had Corey Loftus, who's doing the character designs. I think one of the big things when you're actually around the animals is to take those personalities and bring them into the movie. Elephants have a very specific way of moving their heads. They use their trunks like hands. You'll see that the giraffes in Zootopia run like real giraffes do, but on two legs. Early on, we thought, okay, well, it should just be various types of animals all sort of mixed together, salt and pepper. Are cheetahs aware that they started a whole line of fabric pattern? Or no? No. <laughs> but that's actually not how animals are. There's lots of groups, but they're sort of, here's a bunch of giraffes over here, and then here's a bunch of buffalo over here. They're all intermingled, but they're, they largely stay with their kind of groups. Just like your house cat. Except deadly. <laughs> so as we're figuring out what is specific to each animal, John said, well, that's, that's all great, but you guys really need to go where their world really is. You guys are going to go to Africa. And I'm like, Africa? And he said, yes, Africa. We flew out into the bush on these tiny little planes that jostle around a lot, and we landed in the middle of nowhere, and we were there. We were on this amazing environment that hasn't changed in 50,000 years, and it was eye-opening. There, where you're a guest in their world, it really felt like, oh, OK, you guys are in charge of this place. <laughs> so that doesn't get your attention. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> in the very beginning, we thought, since there's so many wildebeest, we thought the wildebeest would be sort of the business people of the city. They'd be the people in suits walking around. But we learned from our animal experts that the wildebeests are not actually the smartest animals on the savanna. And so it completely changed the design of that animal. Chief, uh, Mrs. Otterton's here to see you again. Not now. Okay. Cape buffalo, they're an animal that always remember everything. And, and it's not that they won't ever forget, it's really that they'll never forgive. So for us, that said, OK, maybe that tough animal needs to be the chief of police. Well, this should be good. All of those things became aspects that we incorporated in the film and helped let us really figure out what animal was going to be what character in the movie. I don't have to be a lonely hunter anymore. I'm going to be an actuary. We also saw so many baby animals. We were expecting, like, oh, there's probably a season where they, all the animals are born, and then that's it. But there were babies everywhere, and they were super cute. And a lot of our animators and our look people were like, ah, uh, we got to put more of those in the movie. At nighttime, you hear hyenas, and you hear lions. Can they eat you? Yes, they can eat you. That changes things. When we saw a 200-pound leopard eating a wild boar, you're 30 feet away from that. And as it looks up at you and has blood all over its face, it's super intimidating. So thinking about this movie where, oh, some of the animals are maybe they're starting to go savage, that would be scary. And so for us to actually feel that was really important. 
So a few days in, there was a big moment. It was a big moment. We walked around the corner from our camp, and right in front of us is this amazing watering hole with hundreds of animals coming to drink during the day. And we were right there. We were right there with these animals. So the first thing we learned is this Don't drink from the watering hole. Do not. Rich is correct. That was oh. like a <laughs> boy. <laughs> so we noticed that no one was attacking anyone. There's no aggression. Everyone needs water, and everyone was coming in and getting what they need and then going their separate ways. And we thought, that's a really interesting social setup. But that's kind of like what cities are, because cities are where people congregate because they all need something. They either need work or they need to have a place to house their families or they need access to goods, and everyone has to figure out how to get along. This idea of figuring out how the city works was all key to that. Tell us about the animals that went savage. Originally, we didn't know what type of animals would live in the city. Would there be reptiles and birds? Do fish speak in this world? And early on, we started to focus in on mammals. For a predator-prey story, those lines were much clearer for mammals only. There could be reptiles that live in another continent, but for right now, this place uh, is all mammals. There's a shot in the film where a train pulls up and you see these three doors open, big, medium, and small, and these animals come walking out, and people just get the biggest kick out of that. One of the most complicated decisions we ever made was we wanted the scale to be true to the true life size of the animals. A lot of these kind of talking animal films take the big characters like elephants, you know, and kind of shrink them down, and small characters like mice and kind of scale them up to create this one kind of homogenous size. And we said, like, you know, we really want to celebrate what makes animals different. Elephants should be big, and mice should be small, and we should kind of play the scale true as we can. In our scale, one giraffe is 95 mice. So how do I actually set a camera to shoot that scene? How do you get a tiny little rabbit and a big elephant in the same shot together without it looking weird? It was a rough challenge, but the results, that's what makes it unique. Yeah, you're a real hero, lady. You need to have ramps. You need to have water fountains that have different levels. You have to have sinks and desks that can adjust, and all this stuff that seems like so much trouble to get into the film is what makes the film so interesting. When you're creating a world like Zootopia, you have to think deeply about how did this world get created by animals? We looked at San Francisco, London, Paris, Las Vegas, Barcelona, Beijing, and it generated some of the most amazingly unique buildings that you've ever seen. If you look around the buildings, you get the sense of some buildings were built last year, but those other buildings were built 20 years ago, and some buildings that were built 50 years ago, and then 100 years ago, and then some really old stuff on top of that. And we really wanted to give the city the sense of a history. Jared had this terrific idea. He said, a lot of cities around the world have not just one big section, but they have different boroughs. Early on, there was this idea, well, maybe certain types of animals sort of have their own parts of the city. You know, carnivores are over here, and herbivores are over here. But as we started doing our research, you'd see it would really be designed by climate. What if Zootopia had a different districts? What if it had the Rainforest District? What if it had Sahara Square? We're going to have the Redentia. We're going to have Tundra Town. We're going to have downtown Zootopia. We're going to have all these different environments. We went to New York because in New York, you have places like Little Italy that are right next door to Chinatown. But there's a downtown where everyone intermingles, and you get this idea that these all, all animals, all people. But in our movie, of course, all animals come together. And we found that that was very common in a lot of big cities. Some of the fun of the city, what made it interesting was hot abuts right up next to cold. How do you do that? If you want to cool something down, just like your air conditioner blows cold air this side, there's always, on the other side, this exhaust that's always hot. So actually, it made a lot of sense to put Tundra Town next to Sahara Square because you'd have that. And then maybe the ice, when that melted, that gave you the water that became the steam for the rainforest and the water for the rain. So there's sort of this natural ecosystem that started to develop that we used uh, for the city and it started to feel like a real city. It feels like you could step into the screen and travel from one environment to the other as easily as taking a train ride. People ask why we go on these research trips, and it's those ideas, things you would have never thought of if you hadn't been there in person with those animals. All right, now smile like a crocodile. And that's what's great about these research trips, you know, when you're kind of seeing these new things and, and you don't know how they're going to really apply to the movie at first. 
We're trying to give you something that feels real. Having a world that combines the best of what a human world can be and also the amazing, jaw-droppingly beautiful world of animals. It's just a great privilege for us to be able to bring something like that to the screen.